way of looking. Yeah, we're live. We're live. Um, hi, good morning, everyone, for people watching, viewing in the United States. Good afternoon in Europe, and good night if people are watching in Asia. I will say it's February 4th, uh, 2021, in case people watch this uh, uh, recording later. And we have the privilege and honor today of hosting Paul De Hert. Paul is a professor of law at the Faculty of Law at the Vrai Universitat Bruxelles. Uh, he's also an associate uh, professor of law and technology at the Tilburg Institute for Law and Technology. In addition to that, he is a co-director and a founder, I think, of the Brussels Privacy Hub, uh, a co-founder of the Privacy Salon, and uh, also a founder in the live spirit behind CPDP, uh, which was actually held last week virtually, unfortunately. Hopefully we're back in person in Brussels next year. This was the 14th uh, version, I think, 14th annual CPDP conference. It was keynoted by Tim Cook, Apple CEO. And CPDP has emerged not only as an incredibly important, but also wickedly fun meeting place for policymakers, for academics, civil society and industry, uh, uh, convening around privacy, data, technologies and uh, related policy issues. Paul has also written and edited countless books and articles. Some of them are really foundational texts in our space. And maybe most importantly, he has raised a generation of law and technology leaders who have been through the various uh, programs. And some of them are really already leaders in our space. But I want to say all of this doesn't do Paul justice, this uh, list of uh, achievements because I really feel that Paul is far more than just a summary of achievements, albeit numerous. Anyone who knows Paul or even meets him for the first time knows that he can light up a conversation or a room or a personality with just a single sentence. And he has a truly unique way of seeing things and expressing thoughts and ideas. Um, what I like, um, especially, is his ability to jump into a conversation after I don't see him for months sometimes, as if we've just been, uh, you know, constantly carrying on the conversation uh, throughout. Uh, Paul is a philosopher, an artist, an entrepreneur, a leader, all rolled into one. So, again, we're lucky to have Paul with us today. Hi, Paul. Hi, Omar. <laughs> I'm catching my breath after such an introduction. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, let's jump right in. And, you know, evident from this little introduction is that you've been in this space for some time, I think actually for almost uh, 30 years. Uh, what do you consider your most important work? Uh, well, it's uh, upcoming, I hope, because <laughs> I still have some time in this universe, in this life, before I recycle and come back as a, as a dog. But um, uh, one second to think. I think it's already old. Uh, I think it started uh, around the period that um, CPDP was founded, and it was with my, my uh, colleague, uh, Serge Goodwirt, and he had a very flexible mind, and he was the kind of partner that I looked for. And it was at a moment, um, 2000, where EU started formulating new fundamental rights and suddenly we had a new right in Europe. It was next to the right to privacy. We had a right to personal data protection. And Serge and me, we jumped on that one and we asked a very simple question that is still uh, very important in Europe, in the academia, but also outside in litigation. What is the difference between these two? And does it make sense to have them both? Because a lot of legal orders outside Europe do not have them both. And um, I think uh, what Serge and I did was to sit down and think freely. And we, uh, we are not very metaphysical, so we, we thought it, it must have been political. So 
And what we came up with was a very simple idea. It was like a division of labor. With privacy, you ask the very important political question, what, what do we want in, an, in a democratic society? And what kind of uh, things are necessary and, and what kind of infringements in our personal sphere are acceptable? So that was for us something connected to boundary tracing. This is acceptable, this is not acceptable. For us, that was what courts should do when they consider privacy. Whereas data protection is a, a set of principles and rules and it's very fluid. And, um, and for us, that was data protection was a tool that you use once technologies and processing practices are deemed acceptable. Then you have to channel them. Then there's an important question that constitutional law had missed in the 19th and 20th century, it was all about shielding and 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 boundary um, uh, protection. So this is not what we want, and this is what we want. But it's an important constitutional duty to to make sure that the things we want are done properly and to guide and channel them. So it's a complicated story. But data protection comes in after we have asked ourselves the question: Do we want it? And if we want it then the question comes, how do we want it? And that's a question that is ideally uh, addressable by data protection. We see that today. Uh, so uh, COVID measures, if we want them, first a good discussion, what do we want? And if we want certain apps, certain things, then data protection is going to explain us what kind of app we should implement because that's what data protection does really well. So it's not really a difference between the essential and the detail. It is distinguishing between legitimate and illegitimate. And then when something gets a green light, the legitimate, saying how the legitimate should be done. And so it's a kind of abstract um, way of looking at constitutional rights. But we think constitutionalism in general is, is taking new directions in the 21st century, as opposed to the older idea of uh, clearly positioning the state actors and protecting citizens against uh, uh, state intrusion, we think that the newer constitutionalism is also about giving more guidance to the state once it is mandated to do something. And so there are other rights like uh, access to governmental docs, documents for us that is a new constitutional right like data protection. And it's telling us how governments should work once they are mandated to do something. So kind of abstract uh, view, but we we liked it. It was not uh, metaphysical. It was not about privacy are these values and data protection are these values. It is about how does a modern society organizes itself politically. And then these newer constitutional rights that, like data protection are very handy and very relevant. So I think that's that's my 2006, 2008 and 2009 work. And I think after that, uh, um, I needed a lot of time to uh, take a breath and to uh, and search to and to come up with something new because we were very satisfied with that. And we enjoyed watching a lot of young authors struggling with the distinction we made between those two constitutional tools. We call them opacity tools and transparency tools. And it's just fun to see how many people try to do something creative with it and often something we did not intend, uh, but that's the fun of uh, conceptualization. It's interesting, uh, Paul, you know, I like to sometimes poke and push back a little. But so you talk about privacy as setting clear boundaries and data protection as a more fluid concept, uh, kind of facilitating uh, uh, or setting some rule standards maybe for engagement once we've crossed the initial threshold. In my mind, it's sometimes the opposite um, in terms of softness or fuzziness, contextuality, uh, uh, compared to kind of uh, clear, more bureaucratic rules. And I'll tell you what I mean. When I think of privacy, and excuse me for talking about the US context, it's just a body of law that I know a little better. Um, I think about constitutional privacy 
And it's, you know, the Fourth Amendment cases, which have been incredibly contextual and kind of soft edged, if you think of the reasonable expectation of privacy standard, right? The most important standard uh, from the Katz decision, that's, I think, 1967. If you think of U.S. v. Jones, the uh, constant collection, collection of GPS tracking as opposed to just uh, a few data points and the Supreme Court says that is an invasion of privacy because of the quantity of uh, data collected. Uh, the Kylo case with thermal imaging, now it's not just privacy in the home because you can see the home from outside. And actually, Chief Justice Roberts alludes to this uh, specifically in the Carpenter decision, saying that um, uh, it, it was cell site uh, location data in that case that was collected for more than a week. And the Supreme Court said, you need a warrant for that. But Chief Justice Roberts says explicitly that if it were for less than a week, then, you know, maybe other rules apply. We don't decide on that right now. So again, it's very soft edged. And then if you think of the privacy towards intrusion upon seclusion and public disclosure of uh, private uh, facts, um, false light appropriation, those two are, of course, incredibly contextual. And, you know, they've endured for more than 100, well, have been developed, I'll say, for more than 100 years now. Whereas where I think about data protection, it's very clear rules. You need a legal basis. These are the six or seven principles. These are the, um, the data subject rights and accountability obligations. And it's a much more bureaucratic, if you will, framework. So but doesn't that kind of turn your um, characterization on its head? Wow. Thank you, Omar. <laughs> it, is, it is morning over there, eh? but you're sharp. So uh, I need to uh, uh, come uh, reach that level too. I think uh, data protection um, has its principles and rules. And what we're doing now is adding a lot of rules to the principles uh, to, to create legal certainty. And that's very fine. Uh, and I think um, uh, that, that makes uh, data protection more interesting and less fluid in a certain way. But uh, I, I, I do maintain the older distinction um, that um, it, the boundary tracing is an important activity in, in regulating human actions and, 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 and human use of technologies. And uh, the fundamental boundaries uh, should be drawn somewhere. And it can be done in data protection law, but it is not always done. And it, I'm not talking about very procedurally small details. These these are okay, but the the bigger statements about the society we want and data protection law could do it, but it doesn't always do it. Um, a legal area that does it all the time is criminal law. Huh? These are is the human behavior we don't want. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. This is clear guidance for us to uh, uh, amend our behavior and adapt our behavior, and we understand it immediately. And data protection once in a while tries to do a similar thing, like you shall not use cookies without consent. That is a moment that uh, where data protection law uh, tries to trace boundaries that are important about uh, and, 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 and may uh, inspire trust in the internet user, for instance. But then, then again, we have a full discussion whether that was successful or not. But so what I'm trying to say is that uh, a society this boundary drawing is about controversial things, often dramatic things where you win or lose. Huh? So um, interruption of pregnancy uh, till how many months? And then the judge says this, this period. And you can be against or in favor and, and, um, and, uh, and you, can, uh, you, are, you can argue that there should be no interruption at all, no abortion or you can argue the opposite, or you can say it shouldn't be that period, but that period. Uh, but it's important that somebody draws a boundary. And now about the Supreme Court, what judges often do is, yes, indeed, they contextualize uh, because they like to avoid, and this has been uh, 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 studied by Sunstein, for instance, uh, 
the um, that uh, judges often like to um, uh, refrain from very abstract normative principle judgments and 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 argue in terms of 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 mid level or low level abstract things they in they might use detail uh, or they might use arguments that are uh, deprived of very principal things just to find a consensus and it's not always clear how to reach a consensus and and a judge will then sense how can i reach consensus and very rarely it is at an abstract level and most of the time it's at mid abstraction level or detailed or very uh, detailed level uh, so what the judges in the united states in the abortion case law have done is avoiding the difficult issue about the status of an embryo is it a is it a living person yes or no and they have uh, brought us to a discussion about delays and 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 so many weeks and so many months and that is what i call uh, judicial cleverness to to lit to solve disputes and to end them in a certain way um but it, for me principally it might be by using the contextual but it is boundary setting that we accept because in our democratic rule of, of of law states these judges are are supposed to do these things and what is their authority it's the authority we give them they need to end a, a dispute they need to solve it uh, it's the nature itself of what judges should do and how they do it is um is uh, open they have their own tricks and techniques but boundary setting is what we expect from them have the european judges uh, say at the high courts the court of justice of the eu and the european court of Euro human rights been diligent um, about the delineation between the fundamental right to data protection and the one to privacy well a lot of <laughs> what is amusing they don't distinguish they use both and i'm totally in favor of that as an academic not but as a as a citizen i want judges to convince us so they throw it together and it's a it is a stronger melting pot that they better soup to drink but um have they been boundary setting and i think yes we are very uh, well served like the americans with the supreme court europe is served by two courts and i've been myself active in the data protection a uh, professional sphere but we applauded every judgment of the court and it was often very controversial what they said they uh, they told the uk that massively putting people in a dna database was a no go the uk hated that because they were pioneering on it but the, the judges said no and then the judges now recently have been saying no to mass and bulk surveillance in, and none of the magistrates in europe likes it so there's a revolt of the uh, of the magistrates and the police forces against the judges but but it is done in civilized way but so the bigger uh, signals about what do we find acceptable at this moment are not coming from the lawmakers they're fuzzy they're not coming from the dpas that's not their game they're coming from our european judges and i admire their persistence and their logic and there is a dialogue huh? but it's not um a, a vulgar dialogue what i what i find vulgar is the way the lobbying is done on these judges because as i said the bureaucrats and the magistrates don't like what these judges say right? but there is a dialogue and there is an opening towards some bulk surveillance but the boundaries were clearly set in the past um 20 years not in the law enforcement directive of the eu not in the gdpr but in the case law of luxembourg the court of justice and in the case law of strasbourg and so yeah it's an important aspect of our toolkit um that's how we keep this society uh uh working we there is a boundary setting apparatus my my claim is that the judges should not be the only one doing that and i would invite our legislator to be um a little bit more courageous and participate in this important regulatory part which is boundary setting and they don't uh, that's really fascinating paul and you know i feel we could spend the entire hour or more talking just about uh, th this uh, i'm intrigued by your um you know mentioning the lobbying that policymakers and institutions do uh in front of the judges uh, trying to sway this or that of course a lot of 
interests are involved and Europe is incredibly complex with its uh, uh, national you know, member states, which have some areas of competencies and the European institutions at uh, different levels. Um, actually, during CPDP last week, um, uh, judge Fantanwitz, um, the judge rapporteur of the Court of Justice for the Schrems 2 case, uh, gave a talk at a Council of Europe event, and that's really fascinating, you know, to see the um, type of thinking and discourse from his side of the bench, uh, which is really strikingly different, I think, from the type of discourse we hear from the Commission, the European Data Protection Board, the DPAs, and certainly industry. But let's leave that for another day because uh, you and I put in the title of this uh, conversation uh, legal anthropology, and we wanted to talk about your area of uh, current interest. So uh, let's let's talk about that and how how does this your you know your best work as we put it uh, between privacy and data protection connect to legal anthropology. Yeah, thank you for reminding us <laughs> about the topic of today. But this distinction between this idea that a society needs boundaries or, or guidance was um, brought me to anthropology. And uh, it brought me to um, certain assumptions that we have about the humans that are in the mindset of the regulators when they make laws, when they draft laws. And um, I was... Uh, this is a, an important idea of a German uh, philosopher of law, Gustav Radbruch, who uh, also worked in Oxford, and his work has been open access translated by the Oxford uh, journals. And he published in 1926 uh, a, a, a beautiful, shorter uh, inaugural about a law's image of the human. And he said, if you want to understand the legal system, you don't have to look at the legal concepts in the law, but you have to look at the image that law assumes about the individual that it tries to address. So if you understand the image of the individual that law has, then you understand the, uh, the law of a certain period. That was Radbrook's thesis. And of course, that image changes and the individual that was uh, on the top of the head in medieval German law, laws is another individual than today's individual. And so Radbruck said, you need to look at that individual to understand the legal system. And that's what I actually would like to do today is to look at uh, the individual that is um, targeted by our lawmakers and, and, and also by data protection law. And so um, Radbruck then um, is very famous for a lot of things, but he, anticipated that the um, option self-centered egoistic citizen that was in in the um, at the forefront of lawmaking in the in modernity would give way to uh, what he called the collective men's a welfare state um, friendly person that was not only pursuing self-interest but also the interest uh, and, and and social welfare of the uh, political community so that's what he foresaw, and it was clearly that for Radbrook that was the way to go. So his advice was, look um, look at the image of law, then you understand the law. Um, this is the best way to understand the law and, um, and, and, and make sure that this image has some, uh, uh, that there is a reality check between law's image and the individual that is out there. Huh? And there's a, a nice image there uh, metaphor being proposed if you if you look at a screen with 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 pixels uh, with with um if you want to understand what is being projected look at the guy projecting rather than at the screen being uh, the uh, where the projected image is shown so look at the image of the individual in the lawmaker's head and you understand the legal system now unfortunately for us Radbrook died, uh, and so we are still one, wondering what is, where are we today with our lawmaking? And then uh, other anthropologists came in and helped us, helped us. And 
Very important for me is, um, is Mary Douglas, who worked in the 60s and 70s, and, and she um, wasn't, without going in a dialogue with each other, she, in my opinion, helps us to understand the kind of laws that uh, were significant and the image of the man uh, in the laws that were a characteristic for the 20th part of the, cent the 20th century. And, um, and she saw a mixture of things going on. And, and, and in the summary, there is a, a brief mentioning of the distinction, the distinction between restricted codes and elaborated codes. And Mary Douglas ties this to, um, to a, a social class analysis. Huh? And she says, well, if you, if you look at the way children are raised in uh, working class families, it is via restricted codes, very short codes that are not really explaining, but um, imposing. And so uh, the, the model of control and education in, that ki in, these, uh, in these families is because I say so. Uh, mommy, why should I do this? Because I'm saying so. Mommy, why, why am I doing this? Or daddy, because you're a boy. Uh, mommy, uh, why, uh, why, uh, why don't you agree with me? Because he's older. Very authoritative, simple arguments. And the use, the frequent use of that kind of argument sets a kind of pattern that, that guides the child in his values and in his, uh, in his educational uh, trajectory. And that is what, uh, it's very simple. We adapt our language depending on the person that is in front of us. And I can imagine that with a, a highly educated professor, you will use other language than with a, a lower educated other person that, uh, that, uh, that, that is losing you from the moment uh, the, the, the sentences are, are too complex or too long. It's a very simple idea. So in middle class families, Douglas said, you have something else. There is a negotiation with children. There, you play on their feelings. You play. You try to manipulate them a little bit. You should do this because out of love for me or out of respect for. Uh, so it's already a longer argument. Or ideally, it's a very rational argument. You should listen because the other person has more experience and and is more uh, and is more expert in this domain. And so we should trust his expert judgment. So children. In, in these middle class families, as Douglas coins them, are, are uh, familiarized with not a, a rigid system of positions, but they are, they are free from such a system. And, but, and this is what Douglas famously coins, they are made prisoners of feelings and rational arguments and abstract principles. Yeah. So data protection is, is almost there huh? when I, when I drop. So, now, this was in the 60s and 70s with solid welfare states everywhere in the West on the both sides of the Atlantic. We were doing good. Huh? And, uh, but it was, and for Douglas, both systems of education, of controlling children were solid, were good, were work because the, uh, the, um, the because I say so argument worked because patterns were clear and respected. And the, uh, you should do so because there is this principle or this argument worked also because principles were alive and, and adhered to by many and so on. Now, the first thing there, and there is a link with data protection, be prudent when regulating. You have to uh, be prudent um, with uh, both systems of control and ideally, and this is already my take home, mix them, make a mix. And we do this in in law, we are uh, we are used to that. We have a criminal code that uh, comprises that includes very short messages: "You shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not marry more than one person." All these things are very simple, without explanation. And why is this? Because we say so. And if you don't listen, there's there's a sentence or a fine coupled to it. So criminal law is a good example of a of a restricted code that works really well. Now. Other areas of law are, are much more fluid and are much more negotiable. And the answer is often it depends. And if you come to CPDP and you engage in data protection discussions, you get the independence. You, get, you never get the because I say so, but you get an IIPP equally 
and that's why it's so hard to get a degree from IIPP. You have to argue. You have to fall back on principles and so on. And, and now, so both could be effective if the, if the underlying foundations, social patterns and the adherence to principles are there. And then I come to my third, the third name I would like to drop today. It's the last one. It's Sigmund Baumann. And I have a book somewhere, but I, um, yeah, he has written many books. It's a Polish, Polish sociologist, and he has written a lot on the liquid society, which is his term for uh, postmodern societies. And so Bauman has worked in, in, in the UK principally and um, has been looking at society today. So he's helping us, Radbruch looked at pre-World War II individuals, Douglas at post-World War II individuals, while Bauman is looking at the individual of today. Yeah. So that is my, these three names, three periods, and we want to understand the image of man in, um, behind the laws. And, and now I come to my point. Huh? Can, so, can I hit yeah. pause before you come to your point? Yeah. If you don't mind. Mm, I like it. I can. Um, um, yeah. Gather your thoughts, your, your force before you come to your point, because then you can land a really strong one. Maybe knock me out. Um, I, 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 just a couple of reflections, Paul, because obviously you said a lot there and you took us through an intellectual history spanning, you know, a hundred years, basically, from the 1920s Germany to uh, current uh, day England. Um, a, a couple of just reflections in, you know, this isn't very educated. I'm just reacting basically to what you said. I'll be a little facetious. And when you say, when you refer to Radbrook's um, uh, theory of law as an image of man, I'd say that data protection law for me invokes the image of a Brussels bureaucrat. Or, you know, of someone who is incredibly well educated, she has a Bachelor of Science, maybe she learned computer science, and then she went to law school also. She has like two or three academic degrees, and she knows both the, um, the engineering and the, and, and the law. It's like a Renaissance person, right? So, so it's almost law that's written at the level of um, abstraction. And, uh, you know, you're talking about elaborated code that's so elaborated <laughs> that uh, even us, the experts who've been living and breathing it for, for decades, really, kind of get lost in the different balancing acts that it assumes. Uh, that's one reaction with respect to uh, to Radbuch. Uh, with respect to to Douglas, this is obviously you know a fascinating, I think, uh, uh, kind of setup because looking at restrictive codes and elaborative code, and then um, overlaying that to a social class stratification is, you know, not only intriguing, I think, but also politically combustive. And, um, you know, what it, what it invokes for me is religion, actually, because I think of, and maybe there's a progression there, you know, so I'm Jewish and I think of the early Jewish law as an incredibly restrictive code. You said it, right? It's, uh, it's the Ten Commandments. Thou shall not do this or that. And, you know, the God of the Bible is incredibly vindictive and punishes left and right. It's like as top down as it gets. And it's actually, it's even more than that. You might know that uh, uh, us Jews, we have 613 mitzvahs. It's uh, um, practical uh, acts that we need to conduct every single day. 
And there is no questioning them that you don't ask, why am I doing this or that? It's just because, you know, it was written this way and it was written thousands of years ago, but you still, you have to do it, of course, if you observe. Whereas later on, it becomes much more elaborated with the Mishnah and the Talmud and now they debate everything and they have like, you know, dozens of different and conflicting actually interpretations and readings of why this is so and so and such and such and there are you know so much so that there are jokes about it like you have uh, two jews uh, it's like three different points of view and three different uh, synagogues but but i think also in christianity you know if you if you think of catholicism uh, kind of uh, being very top down and then working towards the uh, reformation so so maybe this is a natural um, progression but that, but i think it's obvious it's a very uh, uh, interesting and sensitive issue to portray data protection as law for the uh, bourgeoisie or even you know maybe even for an upper upper middle class um as opposed to law for the uh, uh, for the working class um and then in terms of Zygmunt Bauman I think we need to talk a little more about that because you've mentioned uh, liquid fear liquid society um postmodern world and I can kind of see where it's going but I, I think we need to develop it a bit more so just a few reactions and thoughts there and feel free to take them or ignore and move on to your next yeah. point. Because I, I kind of cut you midstream. No, I loved it. Thank you. It gave me time to enjoy. Um, for your first comment was about, isn't data protection law, especially in Europe, uh, aristocratic? Um, Bauman would disagree. Um, it is, you need to work hard in data protection law to make a point and to be followed in that point. You need to do a lot of studying. Huh? And who's the category of people that is working hard? It's the middle class. If they don't work hard, they fall down. Going up is really, really hard. So working people, says Bauman, have no chance of coming up. That is a lost fantasy. And aristocrats have to do nothing to remain aristocrats. So the, it, if you need to work hard in law, it's middle class. Uh, it could be upper because the bureaucrats are having nice salaries, but it's still overall a non-aristocratic um, based model of uh, um, of regulating human behavior and then the what happens to religions is just beautiful so they start with a, a restricted code and then they add uh, a layer on it and they add um, a lot of layers and 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 it and so they mix control models right? they mix um, and luckily for us, because these restricted codes would never keep a society together. And, uh, and so the interface of these professional or lay priests, lay uh, religious professionals is very important. And, um, and it, uh, it guarantees um, that there is a correspondence between um, the image of uh, the religious laws and, 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 and the individual, and, it, and it's a nice adaptive system. It happens with Catholicism too. The, nobody knew what Catholicism was before Augustine in, in the fourth century after Christ started uh, phrasing it, and then Aquino, Thomas Van Aquino, 11th, or uh, just did the same exercise, and that was basically Christian philosophy, but it wasn't. Uh, it was so, but most of our Christian philosophical uh, philosophical uh, guidance is is coming from these two and not from the Bible because uh, that is a restricted code that is and it's a beautiful poetical code too. But so I recognize the um, the uh, the parallel you were drawing with this. Now Bauman um, is with Douglas. We had a solid understanding of what to do today. Uh, we needed to make sure that um, a society functions, that we needed to make sure that there was a good mix of restricted and elaborated codes uh, to get the thing organized. So uh, a system of very basic boundary rules that um, the, the, origin, the lower class or the, or, the, or the plumber, as the archetype is called in the United States, understand, and then a mix of expert knowledge with more contextual 
more in, it depends stuff. Now, Bauman uh, destroys that fantasy. He says none of these two alternative regulative systems uh, are, are valid any longer because social patterns are drifting in this postmodern society. There is no, um, and, and, and on the other side, the, um, the, uh, the middle class system working with principles is really, uh, is really uh, put into question. The only thing they can reach these, these experts in data protection law and other areas of law are very provisional and local settlements that can be changed immediately. And that is the message we're all the time getting from the data protection authorities. This is what we think, but there are always some caveats that, and, 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 and they, they know that finally uh, the addressees could go to court and then the courts would correct, amend, and then the whole discussion is open again, which happens a lot today. So it's, it is a Bauman sees a, 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 a liquidity in, in this modern society and a use of liquid laws huh, that is not helping, that is not bringing us um, where we want to be. And um, <clears throat> so uh, the image, the, 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 um, so what to do with cookies, for instance. The cookies discussion in, in Europe is, is hilarious. It's changing all the time. Uh, but in a positive perspective, one could say that it's going somewhere. Uh, but I, I don't think that's the perspective that all stakeholders have. But it's so what is right today with cookies is wrong tomorrow. You can be guaranteed of that. So that is provisional, local, and it doesn't end disagreements as uh, we. Um, and that is the bottom line. Can a society uh, uh, for a sustainable amount of time put an end to disagreements, bring closure to disputed questions? And so. Uh, where does this bring us? With Bauman, it brings us to a lot of skepticism about, about uh, the law today. The law is missing um, a legitimacy. And, um, and he, is, um, he calls it, uh, how does it call it? The normative dysfunctioning of law. Um, that is one of the, uh, uh, I have to, that is how he opens the chapter. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful notion to, uh, to recall, it's the deficit of normative regulation. And he sees, for him, law today is one of the causes of insecurity. Law today is one of the uh, factors that drives people uncertain and that uh, undermines trust in their reg regulatory capacity. And I think there's a serious warning there for the data protection community, because um, the elaborated code of data protection is very complete, it's self-standing, and it creates a fantasy that a lot of things can be done in Europe with data protection. And so my, my message there is that uh, that will not bring us very far. And without uh, uh, being able to address all the concerns of Bauman about this society adrift. Uh, as a lawyer, I would suggest to uh, make optimal use, use of our toolkits today, at least to um, uh, not to lose faith in the ability of law to regulate and to guide human behavior. And for me, that means that we have to add a little bit more restricted code today. And the courts are doing it a little bit with mass surveillance, and uh, with a, a, a GSM uh, tracking and so on with DNA databases. But there's a lot more that needs better guidance. And so um, let's think again about another language than the elaborated language of data protection. Let's rediscover again our consumer law codes, our um, uh, unfair practices codes, our criminal codes, all these things, and in particularly the, um, the, the set of rules on unfair business practices is, an, is a nice one. It has in Europe a full annex with all the kind of commercial practices that are forbidden. And it's quite clear what you can't do. It is clear what the boundaries are in this commercial relationships because it's in, in that annex with prohibited unfair practices. And I think that helps. It's, it's a part of the work we need to do. And another thing is, of course, thinking in terms of criminal law. 
with its very limited, restricted language. It's incomplete. It is often unfair because the liabilities are dreadful. You can end up in prison. Huh? But it ends, it gives a clear signal. Um, and we should do, uh, but of course, there are less drastic options like a, a, a good rule on cookies. No tracking without consent would be an ideal restricted message huh, that everybody understands. No drone filming me in my garden. Huh? That would that is the kind of guidance we need. I don't. Who wants a drone above his garden? Nobody. So and where can you find that prescript? At least in the Bible, or in these religious documents and in criminal law, you find clear language that set boundaries. Huh? And then uh, all the rest can be left to bourgeois negotiating and, and applying principles and, and it depends kinds of answers. But it's not only children that need guidance, it's a full society of people that, uh, that are in, in search of guidance. And my take on this is that Europe is failing drastically in this respect. We're only working with this one regulatory tool, the middle class tool, the it depends tool, and it brings us nowhere. So, and um, one of the things that bugs me there is the technologically neutrality of data protection that, um, that prohibits us of really considering modern threats. I want a code on drones, a restricted code and an elaborated code. We need one. And I want a draw, I want a code on facial recognition. What should be prohibited? Uh, facial recognition in, in public streets, what should not be prohibited? And I want the simple, the simple team play uh, that Douglas uh, has identified as a, but for different societal sets should be taken into account by a regulator. And I think we can learn a lot. And I, I, I have observed that in my foreword to the CPDP program of this year. At this moment, the United States inspires me because a lot of at city level, at state level, and even at federal level, there are very targeted documents on facial recognition and use of biometric data. So, and we in Europe can only be jealous of these things. Uh, and because there is a mix in it, uh, free from the data protection jargon, uh, addressing the technology and the dangers of this technology in a very straightforward way. Now, I know this is a theme that preoccupies you. It's uh, it, uh, but I think uh, because uh, technology specific regulation can be outdated, I know, I know, I know, uh, but this society needs guidance and it's not coming from the data protection community. They are looking with the hands tied to others and the others are not reacting in Europe because they expect that the data protection community will do everything. So who's going to come up with a ban on facial recognition in the streets in Europe? It's not going to be the data protection authorities. They don't have a clear, uh, it's not their game. It's not what they're used to do. They want, it's not from them. And so civil society has understood this and is addressing again the policymakers to come up with it. So they leave behind the elaborated data protection code. They don't even talk that language and straightforwardly ask for a very specific ban temporarily or or, uh, but that is at, at least giving guidance. And so I'm very happy with it. I see these bans appearing in the United States. They're inspiring us in Europe, but we will have to um, create those bans, uh, notwithstanding data protection. So I hope with these bans, we don't open the table to that data protection community because they will come in with their middle class techniques. And at the end, it is because I said so that we need, and not because there are good arguments, but and contextualize and it depends. We don't need independence all over, and we have them all over. Uh, Paul, this is obviously a scathing critique of uh, current uh, data protection law and its interpretation, especially in the European context. Um, I do have some reactions, and you alluded to a couple of them in your comments. I'll just say, and this might come off as a little snide also, that for an incredibly elaborate um, legal system, elaborate, elaborated, uh, incredibly elaborate legal system, 
the decisions of the Court of Justice of the EU in this space with their sparse reasoning and kind of this is how it is and this is how it's going to be, uh, I find, uh, you know, incredibly almost out of context because the, the law is so nuanced and presents so much texture for balancing acts. And then time and again, the court of justice comes in and without really explaining, you know, at least again in the Supreme Court of the United States context with the narrative and kind of reasoning to and fro, excuse the dog barking in the background, it's, you know, part of the times. Um, but, but there is like a very strong edict, which then, you know, everybody tries to make sense of and to implement the, the regulators and the companies are trying to deal with it. And, y you know, the context I'm talking about, but uh, these days uh, um, it's it's been very difficult for them to deal with it. Um, yeah. A, a, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, thoughts or concerns about your cry for more restrictive codes in data protection. So two of them I talked to you about earlier, and you mentioned them in your comments. It's the issue of consent and the issue of uh, technological neutrality. And you said it, but I I, I think. Um, you know, technological neutrality is kind of obvious. If you have the law of drones and the law of, uh, in the US, we have the Video Privacy Protection Act, which was written for, you know, um, uh, uh, DVR, you know, for video kind of cassettes. Um, and then courts have to struggle to adapt it to the Netflix and Hulus of the world. Um, so so I, I, I think for the most part, regulators and policymakers in the space of uh, tech policy try to uh, um, maintain technological neutrality, and you're actually calling for the opposite here. With respect to consent, you know, for every privacy framework, I find consent is like the hardest not to crack because if you want a really restrictive code and you said, who wants a drone flying over their house? Nobody does. Well, you know, maybe I do. Maybe I would allow it. Maybe I would allow it in return for a certain payment, in which case coming in with a top-down paternalistic code that says you're not allowed to do something is problematic because privacy really... Um, includes in its essence a lack of consent. And if I consent to, you know, even have my DNA posted, uh, the code posted on a public um, network, so be it. There's no mala per se here. It's not uh, um, trade in human organs, you know, or human trafficking. Um, so that's my second point. And my third point is... I, I, I'll call it the law of everything. Uh, Jules Polonetsky and I are working on a paper now called The Law of Everything. And, you know, given that data has become so prevalent and ubiquitous and that all industries and government operations are becoming data-based and data-intensive, every industry today is a data industry, right? It's not just uh, tech and computing you basically have data protection law increasingly regulating everything. It's regulating national security surveillance and it's regulating um, healthcare and COVID-19 response and genetic data and employment relations and anything and everything. If you have the law of everything and you want to apply a restrictive code with you know, case by case specific uh, uh, rules, like you're never going to end. It's it's a never ending project. So I think the idea of data protection was keep it high level, keep it principle based, 
and then it's technology neutral, you have consent in there as a safety valve, and it doesn't become the law of everything. So uh, three critiques for you to uh, refute. And, and sorry for the bucking again. Thank you. Um, the, I don't mind, I think regulatory activity is, uh, is needed all the time. And it's a, a Voltaire Diderot fantasy uh, a French Enlightenment fantasy to have a GDPR for all, for, for the rest of our lives. And, and that fantasy is inaccurate because we, we have reviewed the directives and we have come up with the GDPR. We're already reforming it. We're adding Lex Specialis, the e-privacy directive, and all the DGs are now doing data protection in their respective laws, um, adjusting it to their regulatory targets. So, um, the principle should inspire us, but the regulatory activity uh, is needed and uh, is needed at a... But, but Paul, can I interject? You give it as a, an example, perhaps a positive example, the e-privacy directive, at, at least in our space on privacy and data protection, the cookie regulations are an abject failure. It, it just, it, it didn't work. And, you know, do we want this to be the model going forward? Well, if it doesn't, keep on working on it. And, and bravo that they tried it. And, and, and just by trying it and by saying, we don't want this, you had a, you had a very focused debate. So I, I kind of like this regulatory search for the optimum uh, way of, of dealing with cookies. It's a complex thing. But behind that, there's a very simple uh, thing that should be answered in a restricted code way. Do we want to be tracked or no? Huh? Can we be tracked without consent or no? It's very, a very simple question that is at the heart of, um, of the debate and that is uh, entitled, that has a legitimate uh, uh, claim to be regulated properly. So, but technologically neutrality is, uh, for me, it has its advantages, but technology specificity is as important and we need to combine, combine and combine. And I want to go back to Radbrug. Huh? The question behind bulk surveillance um, has, has given us a lot of, um, a lot of uh, judgments that are long and complicated, although at a certain moment the court authoritatively says it is like this. But these judgments were a result of all kinds of national laws organizing bulk surveillance with the help of DPAs, with the help of DPAs. And so, and I'm very happy that the judges disapproved of that work and actually disapproved of what the DPAs have co-created with all those national regulators. Because the important question is, what about two very important questions? What about non-suspected people, should they be the object of law enforcement interventions of data collection? That is a very important question. What a, should criminal law and intelligence not be something focused on suspected people uh, primarily and, um, and intelligence law on dangerous people? That, are the, uh, that is the old divide. So it was, a, it was a very strong and old value that is put to the test in, the, in these discussions. And the other one is the uh, privileged position of medical experts, journalists, and others. We protect these people, lawyers. We protect these people in a complementary, uh, enhanced way because their role in the functioning of our states is really important. And the law enforcement and intelligence community just has no response to that. And as long as there is no appropriate sort of response to the concerns of the court on these two points, there should be a temporarily ban on data retention, bulk surveys, because that's basically what we're having in Europe. There is a, temporarily a no-go by the court till that data protection community and these regulators come up with better solutions, and they have not yet because they were eager to uh, satisfy law enforcement needs. So I think what I want to say is we need to regulate all the time, and it needs to be precisely in Radbro. Huh? So... What is the image of man when we regulate? And the image of man in modernity was we regulate for the, the normal citizen that can be trusted. And in criminal law, 
we regulate for the for the criminal person, huh? but but criminal law was very specific. So, but now we are regulating um, the the fate of the citizens that cannot be trusted anymore, or that should accept that their data is processed because there might be a dangerous or a criminal person amongst them. So that's another image of man, and the debate about there is very fundamental, and it's also that debate that is at play at behind the facial recognition in the street. So. Elementary questions, are we building a society of trust or are we building a society of distrust, making it bureaucracies easy to catch trails later on? And those it's laziness in my opinion. Now, consent. We are talking about rights. Consent is not incompatible with bright line rules, with guidance, with boundaries, with restricted guidance and boundaries. Consent is respectful of the individual and can easily be incorporated in a restricted code. So the common law um, code on, on this, the, the, um, the protection of the home has been very simple. Huh? No entry without invitation. So that is a clear rule as bright, as clear, as, as excelling in clarity as the you shall not kill rule that law has devised to regulate the house and the owners uh, of the house entitlement to protection and consent was taken into the game. So consent, in my opinion, is not so characteristic for data protection. It can be fully dealt with in, in another regulatory mode, in a fundamental rights perspective, in a criminal law perspective, and so on. Consent is also taken into consideration. Criminal law, um, you cannot kick somebody unless it's in the... Ex 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 unless when you do karate or something. That is no problem for restricted codes like criminal law and, and, and fundamental rights law that should be restricted too. These are our fundamental values. Not all, but these are the ones we... And so consent and a restricted codes, no problem. Yeah? Values, the appeal to all of us. So, And then the last question was about the law of everything. I think it's quite charming that data protection is turning into the law of everything. And uh, the conversation that I would like to see is, is, is uh, a conversation where the data protection community and these authorities understand their own limits, and they don't. They think the only thing they do is, is their processing of personal data? Is there a definition of processing fulfilled? Yes. Is there personal data? Yes. And then they think they have the first word and the last word. And my recommendation would be give them only the first one, only the first word. Data protection is not capable, is not a, a game changer. It is not good in distinguishing um, illegitimate uses of power, of data, and so on, and legitimate power. It is good in channeling legitimate things like commercial practices. That is what we want. And data protection does that really well, but it's not good in giving us guidance on evil, on the things we do not want. And they can, they can promise me whatever, but they failed. And they failed in Europe in many respects. If you look at all those DPAs, they don't say the same thing. I have been following uh, dash recordings, how dash cams, things you put in your car and you film whoever is driving in front of you. Now, that's a serious privacy problem. Did we get any serious guidance from the data protection authorities? Most of them remained silent. Some of them said no, and others said it depends, but yes. The same with thermal heating monitoring in COVID. The same with, uh, with the drones. Uh, do we have clear rules from that expensive set of bureaucrats that they, about the drones that my neighbor is using to film what I'm doing in my garden? No, we don't. And so I would say, let uh, be more humble. That would be my... A suggestion to data protection. You're a good explorer. You're always there first, yeah? but uh, you have a limited role. And then we should take it over and think in terms of a more elaborated, no, in a, in a more richer toolkit where the the middle class, it depends and provisional local uh, solutions found by the data protection community are either uh, encapsulated in more solid uh, restricted codes, bits of it, to give them a more solid foundation, or are rejected. And I think um, 
we should have annual uh, discussion in parliaments about what is the next problem the data protection authorities did not solve in a structural way. And it would be a long list. And so how can we help that community of explorers that uh, can do the middle class trick, but cannot do the working class trick of being very explicit? I, I, I think, you know, I don't know if it does justice to the expensive class of bureaucrats who are trying to um, implement and enforce this. Um, because, uh, frankly, the expensive class of academics who are thinking about it are also struggling to kind of, you know, are, are not aligned. There are many different views because these issues are so broad and deep. And, like, you know, like we said, the, reach everything, the law of everything. How could you possibly converge and certainly when you bring in 27 European member states with different uh, approaches and legal systems and hierarchies. Um, I, 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 and I, I, I would also say that it seems to me that the court many times kicks the barrel down the road and actually forces the data protection authorities to make these decisions. So it doesn't allow them to sort of um, gracefully uh, bow out, you know, at the first stage, like you suggested, but tells them, no, you will decide whether the uh, intelligence and national security apparatus of, you know, like the world's superpower has delicate enough balancing of human rights. I'm not going to decide this for you. Decide it. And you know what? Not just the, um, the bureaucrats, the, the, um, the regulators, but also the companies on a case-by-case -case basis. So, I'm, I'm, you know, and of course you don't speak for the court, but I'm, I'm just saying there are different, I think, uh, dynamics that... Yeah. Um, uh, but I, I mean, the DPAs aren't in a comfortable spot, you no, know? No, 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 and I sympathize. Uh, there, is a, there are two things, uh, different things. Huh? There's first the mechanism of delegating away your own responsibilities. And this is what um, parliaments and, re and, and regulators are doing when they entrust everything to the data protection authorities. And I think that is a shame and a sin. It shouldn't be that way. There's an ethics of regulating well. And uh, we have a, a rich tradition that predated data protection law. We have civil law, commercial law, uh, civil law, the citizen commercial law, the merchant criminal law, the, the evil person. We have, we have such a rich tradition that should be labor law. Huh? Um, and so what will happen now is the, uh, I think all these respective areas of law will start considering um, uh, problems that were now most of the time only addressed by DPAs and I expect better outcomes. I expect more richer solutions and more complete uh, guidance uh, in labor law that has happened. If you, data protection does not talk about the collective representation. It does not uh, consider the uh, transparency as labor law does in Europe. If the employer wants to do things, it needs to be in the internal codes that need to be transparent, that need to be discussed at the, at the um, Enterprise Council and so on. So there is a, a rich tradition in participation, accountability in labor law with mechanisms that are uh, absent in data protection law. And it's important that we do the things there where they belong. And I'm very happy that the digital in this European Commission, for instance, is now spread all over the DGs and that they're all talking with their stakeholders. And uh, data protection should not only be done by DG justice. That would be the wrong approach. Now, um, so one thing I, I, um, I, I, we should firmly condemn is uh, uh, this not is delegating your responsibilities, and this is data protection is ideal to do just that. Parliament just continue to sleep about drones. We will take care. 
with an it depends, very contextual, very fuzzy thing. Uh, we're nowhere with drones in Europe because we left it to the DPA community and they're not very visionary. I think Parliament could do better and has more wisdom uh, as it, um, um, and, and is entitled, has more legitimacy. Now, the other thing that is in Europe at play is we did something very stupid in, in the European Union. We organized data protection in a very binary way. Everything is done by EU law and it is applied by national DPAs. And the Court of Justice will safeguard these two unique roles. And if a member state tries to add one syllabus, one syllable, one comma to the GDPR, the Court of Justice will squash down and says, no, 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 you can't touch this. This is the EU. So the role of the states is really underdeveloped. And luckily for us, the Court of Justice is, is, is on high speed there and is doing, is giving us a lot of guidance on very principled things, but unfortunately, uh, also on very detailed things. The Supreme Court would never do that. The Supreme Court in the United States would only do the interesting bits. Our Court of Luxembourg has to do the plumbering, the dirty work of details, and also the more high level things like discussing bulk surveillance. That is a very a strange pas de deux of this European court. And I personally would not uh, applaud such an agenda. I like one or the other, uh, the plumbering or, the, uh, or the, uh, the more visionary, but this court does it all because probably it understands that the construct is very fragile and the role of states has been disregarded in Europe for the sake of, uh, for the wrong fantasy of uh, an internal harmonized market. But I think states have an enormous responsibility in offering guidance. And so the net result is when the court doesn't say anything and the DPAs don't find a pan-European solution and they never find one apparently, we don't have the guidance. And so what then? We have to wait for the new reform of the GDPR, where we will again discuss whether labor law is in need of a separate instrument, Lex Specialis, because working privacy is such a problem. And again and again and again, I don't, I don't think that's a, a, um, an interesting thing. So my response to your uh, remark, huh? delegation of responsibilities is wrong, but the way we took delegated away to Europe, the responsibilities of the states is a shame and a weakness of European Union law. Great, Paul. So we started with legal anthropology and, um, you know, talking about law as a social class uh, uh, construct. And we ended with Supreme Court justices doing plumbing work. Uh, so I like that um, kind of full circle connection. Um, we are over time. This has been a pleasure and uh, we should do it again sometime soon. So thank you for joining us and uh, be safe and well, my friend. Thank you. And thank you for listening.